Time now for sports on 104.7 The Cave. Here's Ned Reynolds. Mike, the intern Ned Reynolds in the studio on a Tuesday morning discussing footwear. All right. Uh, (laughs) You know, I had high hopes for EB when he went out to Washington to be the OC for the Commandos. I thought that was just a path. Maybe he'd be that for a couple years and then hopefully prove his worth and then finally get a head coaching job. It's just, it's sad because he does not have a job now. And, uh, you know, especially watching what the Chiefs have gone through this year, in my personal opinion, lack of discipline, fundamentals on the regular season, I think that was with the enemy being gone, personally. I think he runs a tight crew. That also means he's abrasive, though. And that, for some teams, might not be a good look. I can tell you he was abrasive because the Washington Commanders players, when he was down there, you might remember they staged something of a walkout and went to the head coach, Ron Rivera, at the time. And Rivera said, hey, don't like it, go to him. Don't come to me. He's your coach, and that's the way it's going to be. So, as a matter of fact, he he stayed there. Now, Cliff Kingsbury, (laughs) this this is funny in my opinion, Cliff Kingsbury was named very early yesterday morning as the Washington Commander's new offensive coordinator under a new coach. All right, that's fine. But wait a minute. What about Eric Bieniemy? They never fired him until last night, and then they let him go. There was a period of time when the Commander's, period of time in one day, when the Commander's had two offensive coordinators. Well, to get around it, they obviously had to let go of Bieniemy. No such thing as two OCs on the same team. Well, they let him go, fired him last night. So, in effect, he is a coaching free agent. The Already, the Pittsburgh Steelers have uh, made note of the fact that they want to talk to EB about being there, being on their team. The Kansas City Chiefs have Mike Nagy as their offensive coordinator. I would think, considering you're right about the lack of discipline and the change in the offensive tactics, that is true. But the Chiefs are in the Super Bowl. They are. And they're playing for a championship. Do you make a change after that? That would be very tough to justify. No. But we will see just exactly what happens. I don't think I don't think AB comes back to Kansas City. And I think it was mutual. I think, really, honestly, he wants that head coaching job so bad. And it w- it's going to be so hard for whoever goes behind Andy Reid in Kansas City to fill those shoes after what that man has done for our team and that city. And honestly, like, I, I there it would be, you, I don't even, I feel so bad for that guy, whoever's going to well, take that job. Well, the fact of the matter remains that if he goes with Pittsburgh, it would t- be tough for him to find, uh, follow Mike Tomlin. Uh, 110%. And Tomlin's a very, he hasn't won championships, but has good teams and the players like him. So, yeah, the enemy is kind of, kind of in a... a, a so to speak, in many respects, how because he has not gotten that head coaching job. He is a very good OC, but we'll see how things work out with the Steelers. He may be able to work some magic and see where Le'Veon Bell is considering a comeback. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that too. I was uh, like, oh, really? How, how long has it been since uh, you've been back in the league? <laughs> anyway, that's a non-story. Uh, we do have a very sad note this morning, though, this don't we? This is very sad. Uh, personally for me, because the man was a very good friend, but one of the Missouri's, not just Southwest Missouri, but one of Missouri's major backers, in sports and philanthropy uh, has passed from the scene. Charlie Brown up in Lebanon. Charlie was the owner, operator, CEO, board president of Missouri Eagle, which is the massive Central Missouri Budweiser and Bush distributorship. A very successful businessman, but also a very successful philanthropist. He was voted, I think it was last year, maybe two years ago, as the best of the best in Lebanon. He shunned all kinds of publicity, but He was a man who gave back. He knew what it was like. Major promoter of sports. Bled the Tigers black and gold. Big Missouri grad. But he also was a massive Missouri State fan. Knew Bill Rowe and all the old coaches down here. He was a former referee, as a matter of fact. A basketball referee. That's the first time I met him. It was back in the late 60s when he was officiating a game. But Charlie was just a wonderful human being who knew everybody. A very popular individual in Lebanon, and this is a sad note, passed away very late last night, Charlie Brown, leaving us from up in Lebanon, Missouri, and our deepest condolences to the family. I'm sorry for your loss, Ned. That's a tough, tough pill to swallow. Uh, Last but not least, the uh, (laughs) opening game plan for the NFL. We're already talking about that. We haven't even finished this season. This is another (laughs) major marketing ploy by the NFL. They, they're just so progressive in what they do. 
Everybody knows about the opening game. It's always the Super Bowl champ versus whomever, and always at the Super Bowl champs home. This is their home opener, and it is always on the Thursday night. Then the rest of the season commences uh, over the weekend. But no, not, <laughs> not, not next fall. There will be a game on Friday night, and the Friday night game will be in Sao Paulo, Brazil. This is the very first ever international opening night game that the NFL has done. The host team will be the Philadelphia Eagles. Who they play, nobody knows. It hasn't been decided yet. But it'll be the Eagles against somebody in Sao Paulo at a huge soccer stadium they have there. Going to Brazil was known. The NFL said they were going to do that, advancing deeper into South America. But to have an opening night on a Friday night like this when the NFL disdains all kinds of games because of high school football, uh-uh, not this year. <laughs> what do you think about uh, they got a pretty big year? I mean, I know you bleed uh, green and white. What's the what's the fan base down in Brazil for the Eagles? Well, I must admit I don't know. I don't, I've never been to Brazil, but I would have to assume that the NFL has done a lot of research and decided probably accurately so, they do very few things that are inaccurate, that there is a level of interest in American football down there, and they're going to give it a try. Of course, they have a whole, what, nine months to market oh, the yeah. thing, which, and, which they oh, they're going to market the hell out of it between <laughs> now and then. I'm, I'm telling you, you look pretty good down in South America, Ned. They got, they like guys with deep voices down there. So Boy, I think, from I Ipanema, think, I, right? I think you do, yeah. <laughs> hell yeah. Exa man, we're going to make this happen. We need to, uh, or I guess we, anyone that's a Kansas City Royals fan needs to thank whoever got that deal done with Bobby Witt Jr., man. Well, the fact of the matter remains it's the Chiefs who are getting all of the publicity, but here come the Kansas City Royals. They know they have a budding superstar. They know or knew that they had a history of dealing away those budding superstars. Well, Bobby Witt Jr. and the Royals have gotten together and come up with an 11, I love this, too, it's an 11-year deal worth $289 million with many, many perks in there to move that even higher. What the Royals did was lock him up. Now, he's, he's not even eligible for free agency for another four years, but that's moot point now because he is signed and ready with the Royals, and he'll be with them right through his formative years, assuming now he does have some options to get out of it after seven or eight years, somewhere around there. But Bobby Witt Jr. is a future superstar. He's already proven that. Last year, he had 30 home runs, a whole slew of RBIs, and while the Royals themselves were not a very good team, he was a star player. And you can see Kansas City now trying to build their roster young and have it formed around him because he's a kid. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, they signed him and got him ready, and they beat that free agency deal. And I think it's, I think it's, it's a, a sensational sweet, move. And it's a it's a mutually benefit deal. The oh, Royals yeah. benefit. Junior benefits and everyone benefits. And I used to watch him beat up on the Springfield Cardinals um, down here in Hammonds all the time. I mean, he's he's going to be something. So congratulations to them. Hopefully, he's he or the team that got that done is getting a suite in Las Vegas this weekend. <laughs> um, so we had a little bit of a showdown in the Sunflower State between the. K-State Wildcats and the KU Jayhawks. I have it twice a year. Of course, they're both in the same conference, so they play home and home, and it's home and home are not very far, Lawrence and Manhattan. Already played in Lawrence once this year, and KU won that game. Last night in Manhattan, big crowd, raucous crowd on hand. They always are at the Bramlage Arena. And it was back and forth and back and forth. I really think when you take a look at the numbers in here that KU probably had the lead for the longest portion of the game. But at the end, tie game, overtime, and K-State came away with the win. It was K-State 75, KU 70, and this is on a day after KU had been named as the fourth-ranked team in America. Watching Bill Self's team play, they're good. They're very, very good. Solid basketball team, but they may be missing that little spark that could drive them to a national championship. That remains to be seen because we're about a month away from tournament time. But the fact is that KU did not play in the overtime well enough to get a win. K-State did. Go Wildcats, baby. Go Wildcats. All right. So let's just get this out there. It's been a lot of whining going on, especially last night watching uh, Travis Kelsey get booed in Vegas for the opening night ceremony at the Super Bowl, which is funny. 49ers complaining, you know, we held Bosa four years ago. The refing's going to be awful even though the game hasn't played, even though that one of the refs used to be a 49er. Now it's the practice field isn't good enough. 
Well, they did make this complaint, but it was a very minor complaint. The media has taken this and, and run with it because they're looking for all sorts of stories. Well, it's really a non-issue. They, the <laughs> whole circumstance is this. Because they are the visiting team, the 49ers get second choice for practice facilities. And they're the uh, practice field that they have is at UNLV, Nevada, Las Vegas. The Chiefs are practicing on the Las Vegas Raiders training field, which is top notch. Well, in Las Vegas at UNLV, they play on artificial turf. So the NFL brought in several natural surfaces and covered it. Well, it's a little soft. And indeed, the 49ers said, hey, this is not solid enough for us to be practicing on. NFL sent out their group of experts and went through it. On two occasions, and said, nah, there's nothing wrong with this. You guys are just complaining. So last night, Kyle Shanahan, the 49ers coach, said, done deal. Not talking about it anymore. This is where we're going to practice. So it's a moot point. It's not going to be anything but the 49ers. It, it's the media getting in the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of San Francisco fans crying. That game hasn't even happened yet, Ned. You have a great day, and I will see you tomorrow.